From the Oregon State University's Extension Service, you are listening to In the Woods with the Forestry and Natural Resources Program. This podcast aims to share the voices of researchers, land managers, and members of the public interested in telling the story of how woodlands provide more than just trees, they provide interconnectedness that is essential to your daily life. Stick around to discover a new topic related to forests on each episode. Welcome back to another episode of In the Woods. I'm your host, Lauren Grand, Assistant Professor of Practice and Extension Agent in Oregon State University's College of Forestry. Today's topic is What's in a Woodland? I'm really excited to have joining me today, Daniel Stark, Assistant Professor of Practice and Extension Agent serving Clatsop, Tillamook, and Lincoln Counties. Dan has a Master's of Science with a focus in wildland fire and forest health from UC Berkeley. Previous to his work at OSU, Dan spent six years working as an outreach coordinator for the California Oak Mortality Task Force and University of California Cooperative Extension Service. Welcome, Dan. Thanks, Lauren. Dan, I'm so excited to have you on the podcast as one of our first guests, mostly because I'm lucky enough to know you as a good friend outside of work. I know. It's so great that we are coworkers and we're also friends. Yeah. I really love that. <laughs> because I have the pleasure of knowing you as a really good friend, I also happen to know that you have a special interest in conflict resolution around contentious forestry-related issues. So, of course, I'm going to start with a contentious forestry-related issue, just to catch you off guard. What's the deal with all the terms for forests? How come some people call it a woodland, some people call it a forest, and some people call it a timberland? What's the difference? I mean, which term do we use to describe our forests here? (laughs) Um, So we could choose forest, we could choose woodland, timberland. You know, are there differences between those? They all mean the same thing. They all mean forest. Um, So I I was preparing for this. I was looking up what woodland meant and I I studied the etymology of it. And it's actually a term that's old English. um, Woodland, I think is how you pronounce it. (laughs) back to the 14th century. Um, So it's just kind of cool how we have these forestry terms that have just stuck around with us for literary centuries and they're still used today. Yeah, you got it, Dan. It's not really a contentious forestry related issue. I was just yanking your chain there. I just wanted all of our listeners to know that throughout the podcast, we're probably gonna refer to forests as woodlands or timberlands or interchange them here and there. And we want everyone to know that we're talking about the same thing. We're talking about forests. And today we're gonna be talking about what's in a woodland. And Dan's gonna help guide us through that. When we talk about woodlands and forests, the first thing that usually comes to people's minds is trees. Dan, what can you tell me about the trees that we find in woodlands? Yeah, so I mean, they are trees in a woodland, right? So they are the obvious structure. It's what we see, right? And um, forests and woodlands are actually defined by you know the presence of trees. So I mean, it makes sense that we think a lot about trees. Um, trees vary by location and by site. So depending on the like pr- um, particular um, ecology of, pr- of a particular site, um, you're going to get a particular um, tree that grows there. Um, they could be a single species. They could be mixed species. Um, Going back to ecology, um, I also think about, you know, how disturbance really plays a role in, um, you know, um, and what kind of tree grows on a site. So if you are in an area of Oregon, let's say that, you know, gets or is prone to a lot of wildfire, it's really dry and stuff, you're going to get a particular type of tree that grows there that can do well in that type of environment, like a ponderosa pine, for example. Um, Out here on the coast, um, we don't have fire as a major disturbance agent. Um, um, It's very infrequent here on the coast. Um, So we get trees that are more adapted to, you know, wet conditions and and these foggy conditions here. So we get things like Sitka spruce. So um, the the location of where you are and the ecology on the site, the type of disturbance that happens, um, those all work together to produce this forest that we see and that we live in and work in. That's awesome. Um, So you mentioned that you have Sitka spruce there on the north coast. What, else, what other type of tree species are pretty common over there? 
Yeah, well, we have, um, oh, there's such pretty trees up here. So we have um, Sika spruce, and um, I have a lot right outside of my window here working from home, and I just love them. And they have this great lichen hanging from them right here on the close coast, and lots of fresh air here. So we get lots of lichen hanging from these trees. Uh, we have Sika spruce. Um, we have a lot, of, um, a lot of the hardwoods that you might see throughout in other places in Oregon, too, like big leaf maple. Um, we have um, red alder. Um, and we also um, have some Douglas fir around. So um, um, a lot of great, beautiful hardwoods and we have some conifers there too. We also have Western hemlock, um, just some really beautiful trees that just thrive and do really well up here on the North Coast. I'm based in Eugene and we have a similar similar set of, a set of trees. Um, maybe we have a little bit more um, cedars, types of cedars, so Western red cedar as uh -huh. well as grand fir, which I personally like, you know, because of my name. Yep. And it is your fur. <laughs> my fur, right. Yeah. Um, we have red, and red cedar up here too. Yep, sharing that color. <laughs> and then um, because we're sort of in the confluence of where it starts to get really dry, we also have incense cedar um, as we're at the northern part of incense cedar's range. And then we also have some oak, Oakland. So here in Eugene, we have um, Oregon white oak. And we're starting at the confluence of where California black oak begins as well. So kind of um, fun to have different different woodlands around no matter where you are. And then our friends over on the east side, um, I'm jealous. They have large trees. Or, do you like large trees? I do. And uh, being a California boy originally, I don't have a lot of ex you know exposure to large. So when I see them, I'm always like, oh, my gosh, it's a large. How cool. <laughs> I know it's really exciting. Something interesting about Oregon is that um, actually on the coast, uh, somebody planted a stand of large trees in the shape of a smiley face. Oh, nice. And you can only see it in the fall when the trees start to turn yellow to lose their leaves. And there's a yellow smiley face in the side of the hill. Um, wow. So I don't know exactly where it is. It's um, mid-coast, I think, but... Um, uh, you all should look it up and drive by one day. <laughs> See oh, I will. Days. That sounds really cool. And I just have to say, I really miss the oak woodlands. I mean, they are just some of the greatest trees and some of the most long lived trees. And they just, they're so beautiful and they have their own ecology and, you know, they just, their own diversity. Some of the most diverse forests that we have are oak woodlands. Just beautiful. I miss the oaks. <laughs> <laughs> you have to come visit me more then. <laughs> I will. I will. <laughs> So we talked a lot about trees and um, trees are obviously one of the most exciting and beautiful parts of a woodland, but there's many other parts. So what else do we see in woodlands, Dan? Well, my background is in forest health. So one thing that always stands out for me are the, what we call pests. I mean, they are ecological components of a forest, like an, uh, a bark beetle or, or other forest insects and um, um, crucial to the functions of the forest, but they become pests, right? So they, they cause some kind of economic injury. So I pay attention to things like bark beetles and, and forest pathogens and um, pathogenic fungi, and you know, that can cause some kind of forest health issues to your, your forest. So there are also beneficial insects and, um, um, and, and, and beneficial uh, fungi as well. So I think of mycorrhizal fungi, for example. So um, not, all path uh, not all fungi and not all insects in the forest are bad. There are important components of a woodland. There are also animals, um, our, our wildlife, um, um, of course, water, right? In our watersheds, um, a lot of our water comes, most of our water <laughs> um, comes through our, our, our watersheds here that we manage here. Um, there are soils, right? You can't have a forest without soil you can't grow plants without soil or your substrate um there are of course can't leave out humans um, we often like to think of humans as separate and um, apart from from our woodlands and our nature but we are very much um a part of the, our, our woodlands and have been for forever that was a good list of, of things that are in a woodland sometimes it's hard to narrow down all the other things that that are going on in a woodland besides the trees but i think you did a good job of hitting most of them so, Dan, can you talk to us a little bit about why we need to look beyond the trees when we think about a woodland? What's so important about how all these other aspects are involved with the trees? Yeah, well, it's about this interconnectedness, right? Between all of the, everything that we listed here and then beyond, right? So um, I, I talked about soil. So 
A tree can't just grow on its own. It depends on so many things that it's connected to in a forest. So looking at the soil, right? So it has to be the right type of soil. There has to be the right type of micronutrients in that soil to support the growth of that tree over its over its over its lifetime, over its over its lifespan. Um, mycorrhizal fungi. We talked about the fungi present there um, that are um, help the tree grow. And and um, so just that connectedness, just with between the soil and the tree alone. Then we look at the bigger picture, right? I mean. Look at water and abundance of water, um, or or lack of water, right? If there's um, if you have a, a lack of precipitation, or there's too much precipitation, um, that there's a connectus connectedness there. Um, with the atmosphere, right? And everything in, in a forest. So again, my background is in forest health. Um, I think about those forest insects that can cause damage and, you know, on the surface, I mean, yeah, they do cause some kind of economic damage, but they really are filling out an economic, um, or sorry, not an economic <laughs> function, an ecological function, and they have an ecological role to play. Um, and they too, are not separate in this equation. So there are birds that like to feed on those insects that are feeding on the trees. So it really is just about that connectedness. Trees are there and they're wonderful, but they depend on everything else in that system just to survive and to get through their long life. <laughs> and it's a struggle. <laughs> it is a struggle, especially when you live for 250 to a thousand years, you know, there's lots That's of right. stuff you have to deal with. Yeah, constantly just, you know, I mean, just think of everything that could just go wrong for a tree with with, with pests and just with droughts and too much rain. I mean, it's a hard life for a tree and they really are durable creatures. <laughs> they are, yeah. I especially liked your example about the pests and then the birds eating the pests. And even if those pests kill those trees, you know, uh, uh, all my biology, wildlife biology friends are always saying, more dead wood, right? So That's even right. if those insects kill those trees, it creates homes for more of those wildlife that you see in the forest. So. That's right. And thinking about the ecological role of what we call pests, I mean, they could be beneficial to the, the population of trees as a whole, because unless they're an outbreak condition, meaning they're, you know, this is what we hear a lot about when we um, hear about parts of British Columbia or the Rockies where just, you know, thousands of hectares are taken out by the mountain pine beetle or other beetles. Um, when they're not in that outbreak stage, they perform an ecological role. So they can actually um, help in the natural selection of that overall forest and the those trees by weeding out the, the more weak individuals that aren't quite doing so well on a site. So even though it might be, you know, look horrible that they're killing some trees, you know, that, that dead tree, like you mentioned, could provide habitat for a whole host of different wildlife species. Um, those nutrients get broken down and get returned to the soil and, you know, feed other trees. And um, so, you know, there is a place for everything there. That's a good point. Sometimes we, for, we see dead trees and we get really upset about them, but it's always important to remember that they have value as well. That's right. So we talked a little bit about in your list that humans are part of a woodland. Can you talk a little bit more about humans or our humans? Like we're not humans. I'm talking about humans like we're not humans. How about our role as forest managers or our role as humans as in the woodland? Yeah, yeah. So um, humans are animals. <laughs> and we are a part of the forest, just like other animals are. And um, I, you know, this is, a, we could talk forever about this one. There's some really neat kind of, um, just how we got to this point where we think of forests and nature in general as separate. And when in fact, it's been, we humans have been a part of forests forever, right? Um, and um, just one need only look at our indigenous communities who have been around for, for thousands and thousands of years um, being a part of forests. And, and um, we are not separate from forests. So, I mean, you and I work in forests. We also, in Oregon, we live in forests, right? I mean, this is one of the best states here. <laughs> you know, um, we have a lot of forests. So chances are, um, if you're, especially if you're in the more Western part of the state, <laughs> you're gonna be in some forests. Um, and of course, other parts of the state too. Um, so we, we live in the forest, we work in forests, we depend on forests, right? For our food and for products and for air and um, wildlife, everything. We are a part of forests. They're a part of us. You're absolutely right, Dan. We are a part of the forest. And many, we as um, extension agents work a lot with people who own forest land and are actually managing some of these smaller properties that they live on. And I'm always interested in letting the public know who doesn't manage land, 
how these people steward their land. So how does it that they, the people who own land actually make decisions about what they want to do when they're managing their woodland or forest? Yeah, well, um, I'm thinking a lot about this right now. Um, we're, um, I'm teaching a class coming up on basic woodland management. So, you know, this is really where we get into the nuts and bolts of this here and really starting with the basics. And what we, we, we start off with is really just, you know, finding out what's on your, uh, assessing what's on your property, first of all, like what, what do you have growing there, right? And then coming up with some goals, right? You need to, what do you want to do with your property? You know, this is your woodland. This is, you know, no one else is going to tell you what to do. Um, so think about what, what you like and what, what you'd like to have for your property. Are you going to be, um, is your goal to um, just provide a nice sweet spot for you to retire and you're just going to hang out there and, um, you know, just enjoy this, the, the, the beauty of your trees. And, you know, are you going to manage for wildlife? Are you, you know, are you really into encouraging um, a particular birds, let's say to your, to your, um, to your property? Um, or you might, you know, really like deer coming in, <laughs> um, deer browse. And a lot of people don't think of the deer and elk as pests, but you know, that might be something you enjoy there might be a part of your your property where you can really enhance that habitat you might want to have some grow some timber right you might want to um, 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 manage your forest so you can um, cut down some trees and um, provide a little income for you and your family and down the road too for 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 your family down the road um, and leave that legacy for your family so really coming up with that objective you might have several objectives right depending on how big your property is um, you most likely aren't going to just have a single objective. So thinking about what those goals are for a particular parts of your property or for your whole property, and then really backing that up with a plan. So developing a plan, how do I meet these goals? Um, what is it I need to do? Um, who do I need to contact? What resources are available to help me? Um, and how do I meet those objectives over time? Um, so, and your plan is going to change too. So what plan you might start with today will probably change down the road, right? We, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. We can predict as best as possible, but you know, things around us change and then our ideas and the way we, we live our life change too. So um, that's okay. Uh, build some flexibility into your goals and your management objectives. This is a long term strategy. You're not just planting a garden for, for to harvest at the end of, of the season, right? This is something that's going to be with you for a long, long time. Yeah. And I mentioned, you mentioned um, getting some help. And so do you have, who are the people that we can talk to to get some help about coming up with what these management goals are and maybe some, some plan ideas for reaching those goals? Gosh, Lord, I don't know. If you find out, please let me know. <laughs> I've been looking everywhere. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Oregon State um, Forestry Natural Resource Extension is your one-stop shop for a lot of those resources. So check out what we have online and um, give us a call too. Call up your call up your um, your county extension forester, um, and they're here to, here to help. So I mean, we work hard to. Um, provide content and education for folks. So um, apart from um, your extension office, I mean, reach out to um, your local ODF office. We have stewardship foresters that are here to help woodland owners and to um, you know help them with their management plans. Um, I know a lot of small woodland owners who hire consulting foresters. So um, this works really well um, for people who, you know, these are, this is the job of a forester, right? You might know the, not know the first thing about like what, what, you, what you need to do in your forest. And the, this is the role of a, of, a, of, of a consulting forester is to help you understand um, what's on your property and how to manage it for you and, and to help you find the best solutions for you. Um, oh my gosh, there are just so many resources in Oregon. Like I mentioned, I'm from California and we have a, had a lot of resources down there too available for small woodland owners. But my goodness, up here, there's just so much. And as you know, someone new to Oregon, I've been using a lot of these resources myself just to brush up on what's happening here. So one of my go-tos is the um, Oregon Forest Resource Institute. Um, and they just have all kinds of educational content for people and to help them understand forest management practices, to help understand wildlife and, and regulations. And um, it really is a good spot just to um, kind of clear up, and, you know, if you're, if you're not sure about something, you'll get the answers on that site. So there's just so much information available for people here in Oregon, and it's it, it really is um, 
an exhaustive list, I feel. <laughs> um, so reach out and, and your, your extension forester can help you navigate through all of those resources too if you're having problems finding where to, where to look for the right things. Yeah, good, uh, good plug for us. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> it's, true. it's true. And we can help connect you to, there's many more people on that list. And so we're happy to help connect you to all those people. You mentioned earlier that people have goals and objectives and then you come up with a plan. And so I'm just curious, you know, the landowners that are coming up with this plan or the consulting foresters that they hire or the extension agents that give them suggestions on things that they might be able to do to reach those goals. You know, how do those people know what is available or what what management activities are available for people to be able to steward their land effectively to reach the goals that they're interested in reaching? I have two words, forest science. There is a lot of research out there um, available to help us make decisions about um, the management practices that, that we choose, uh, dependent on our, our, our chosen goals, right, and our objectives for our property. So a lot of those, a lot of that research is around um, this applied um, ecological techniques, right? So um, a, a, let's put that into plainer words. So um, we could mimic the natural processes that happen in a forest and 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 base our management practices on some of those um, natural processes. For example, let's say, um, think about root disease. So um, root disease, um, it's, you know, it's caused by fung uh, fungus and um, it can spread from root to root and you get these, these disease centers. So some of you might, might've heard of, of, um, of, you know, like a, um, um, something like armillaria or, or heterobacidian anosum, anosis root rot, or some other kind of, of root pathogen that causes this mortality center in your forest. Um, so you get, what ends up happening is you have a patch there. So that patch gets reseeded often with, with either by natural regeneration, or you can plant in those gaps there to recreate or, you know, to um, have a different, uh, a new forest in that opening there. So there was an opening created by that, that these, and, and there's, that's a spot for new seedlings to grow. So you can create that and mimic that processes too on your own property. Let's, you know, we talked about managing for wildlife, you know, there might be um, a, a part of your property where you want to have a particular type of trees growing that will, you know, encourage a particular type of, of bird species, for example. So that group process, you can plant in those groups and kind of mimic those natural processes. So there are lots of examples of this in, in science and, and through research. I mean, another one of these natural processes is fire. So think about how fire can impact your landscape and your forest. So um, I think about um, in more of our drier type forests where we have um, um, historically more low intense Fires, um, meaning that you know they they, um, they they're not going to be killing a lot of trees. They typically stay close to the ground and and serve as this function, and that they happen more frequently historically too. So that comes in, and so that will naturally thin out what we call those ladder fuels. So trees and and other shrubs that that form a ladder up into the canopy of other trees. So fire can, those low intensity fires in particular, we can also, you know, use prescribed fire to recreate that as a management process, um, a, as a management technique to recreate that structure that fire has by thinning out those, those ladder fuels. So fire isn't a prescribed burning, isn't always an option in a lot of places due to air quality concerns and um, a lot of uh, regulations or, you know, it, it's hard. We don't have big windows for prescribed burning either. So um, we can have management techniques that mimic what those low intensity fires can do by uh, thinning from below, for example, um, um, coming in and, and, and cutting down those those ladder fuels. And um, those can be, those fuels can be um, removed from the forest. So they don't have any kind of value timber wise or thing like that, but they could be um, either put in a slash pile or they could be, you know, sent off and be used as biomass. So um these, what it all is to say is that we have a science that shows us that we can manage for us. And that's based on this applied ecological techniques that, that, um, uh, that we've been studying. Forest science is, is really great to have, to be able to help guide people through what decisions that they make when they're managing forests. And it's always changing and evolving, which is also fun and exciting. And we're learning new techniques all the time. Thank you for sharing some of those really good examples. Thank you 
so much for joining us today, Dan, to talk about what's in a woodland. Um, as we start to wrap up here, I have a few questions I want to ask you that we plan to ask all of our guests. The first one is, what's your favorite tree? Okay, my favorite tree. It's hard to choose just one, but I would have to say it's Ponderosa Pine and Jeffrey Pine. <laughs> <laughs> that's two. Um, <laughs> that is two. They're close, there, but it's two. There was a period of time where they thought they were the same tree because they're so similar in in, um, in appearance and, and everything else. So um, but they actually are very different trees. Um, I love Ponderosa Pine and Jeffrey Pine for different reasons. So, um, I mean, both are just really suited for adapting uh, to dry climate. And um, I just think that they grow beautifully and just the, that typical conifer shape and I love pines in general. I just love the scent. And what I really like about Ponderosa and Jeffrey and, and Ponderosa in particular is just that big puzzle-like piece bark that they can get when they get super old and just those really deep ridged furrows in the bark. And they're just like this big platelets of, but they're just so fantastic. And of course that's a fire adaptation. Um, and it's just fantastic. Their needles are adapted to fire. They grow long, they're skinny. So they fall on the ground and they could create little piles or they do create little piles of, of um, uh, needles on the ground and those help ignite fires. Right. And so that that's all an adapt adaptation to a frequent fire regime. They're just super cool. Um, Jeffrey pines are just as cool as, as Ponderosa. Um, they tend to dry, grow on more drier sites um, and they sometimes can smell like butterscotch. And I just, I love that smell. And it just, they're just such beautiful trees and they, they just are survivors. And I, I just love them for that reason. Yeah, they're gorgeous. Have you ever um, tried to put the puzzle pieces back on the bark of the Ponderosa pine? I, I have not. I'm, I'm usually chopping them off with my axe. <laughs> to look for insects. I'm not putting them back on. Oh, you always help, guys. Always have your axe with you. <laughs> yeah, well, I've, I've spent many a lunchtime um, underneath a ponderosa pine eating a sandwich and trying to sometimes re-puzzle the trees back together. Uh, the time go by when you're out in the Yeah, <laughs> that sounds delightful. <laughs> so our second question is, what's the most interesting thing that you bring with you in the field, whether it be in your cruiser vest or your field kit? All right. Well, I just gave one of them away. I like to bring an axe with me and have a big blue handled axe that I got from um, one of my forest ecology professors back in college. And you had him too, Lauren. Joe, Professor Joe McBride, mm -hmm. emeritus professor now, passed on his axe to me. And I, I carry that with me with pride. And um, it, I use that to chop into trees when they're dead and just to, to look for um, forest health issues and pest issues. Um, so, but I mean, that's not too weird. I think one of the things that... Um, I just really treasure to this day. And um, I'm gonna send you a picture of it. Maybe one day you'll be in the field with me. I have an old school, old timey Tupperware container <laughs> that has three compartments, one big compartment for my sandwich. And then there are two other little compartments, one for where I put some kind of potato chip <laughs> or tortilla chips. And then there's even a little pocket or a little space for some dessert, or maybe sometimes I like to add a pickle. Um, it all depends, but it stays nicely separated. And um, my mom said that off to me or said that with me when I went off to college the first time um, way back in the early 90s. So um, that, that piece of Tupperware was probably old at that point and it's still with me today and it's cracked and um, I'm going to be duct taping it here. I, I just love it. I, I put it right in the back of my vest and um, it, it's a little bulky, but hey, it, it works and I, and I love it. So yeah. <laughs> You know, Dan, what they say about fashion is what goes around comes around. And, you know, yeah, that style, yeah, yeah. I've, been, yeah. I've bought myself a Tupperware with those same compartments. They're quite <laughs> handy. I like them very much. Mine's silicone, though, so you need to be up with the times. And It's true. Yeah, yeah. I don't really <laughs> want to bring back more plastics, but um, yeah, I, the concept well, is there. <laughs> I think the duct tape will keep its character hot. I hope so. <laughs> okay, so our last question is, what resources would you recommend to our listeners if they're interested in doing a deeper dive and learning more about how forests grow on their own? 
Well, I, I, I think that just the best place to find all this information is really the um, Forestry Natural Resources Extension site. It's a good starting point um, for sure. Um, a lot of great resources there available at your fingertips, and they're all categorized nicely. So have a look at that. So whether you're interested in management, um, if you're interested in, in you know, um, fire um, prevention or, or um, um, defensible space or any of that, check out the, fire, uh, the FNR Extension website. There's all kinds of information there for you. Um, one of the other sites that I really love and just um, really helps me out um, is knowyourforest.org um, and that's the website put out by Oregon Forest Resources Institute and like I mentioned previously just anything any type of educational um, content that you need to help understand forest management practices to understand the forest practices rules in Oregon to understand issues of wildlife and water use and management it's it's everything is there so um, lots of information and be sure to reach out to your extension forester um, um, who again can help you navigate through all of these and um, can help you narrow down um, some of those those resources that sometimes might seem a little overwhelming. Those are some great resources. Yes, definitely. And we'll be sure to put them in our show notes for people to be able to find more easily. Well, that concludes this month's episode of In the Woods. Thank you so much, Dan, for joining us. It was really fun being able to chat with you. You're welcome, Lauren. It was a pleasure to be here. It was fun to chat with you too. <laughs> Thank you all for listening today and stay tuned for next month's episode with Dr. John Bailey from Oregon State University's College of Forestry on how forests grow. Thanks so much for listening. Show notes with links mentioned on each episode are available on our website, blogs.oregonstate.edu forward slash in the woods podcast. We'd love to hear from you. Visit the Tell Us What You Think tab on our website to leave us a comment, suggest a guest or topic, or ask a question that can be featured in a future episode. And also, give us your feedback by filling out our survey. In the Woods is produced by Lauren Grand, Terry Berger, Jacob Putney, Stephen Fitzgerald, and Jason O'Brien, who are all members of the Oregon State University Forestry and Natural Resources Extension Team. This podcast is made possible by funding from the Oregon Forest Resources Institute. Music for In the Woods podcast was composed by Jeff Hino, and graphic design was created by Christina Freihoff. We hope you enjoyed the episode, and we can't wait to talk to you next month. Until then, what's in your woods?